Law 46, never appear too perfect. Appearing better than others is always dangerous, but most dangerous of all is to appear to have no faults or weaknesses. Envy creates silent enemies. It is smart to occasionally display defects and admit to harmless vices in order to deflect envy and appear more human and approachable. Only gods and the dead can seem perfect with impunity. This is uh, Thursday, September the 7th. Welcome to Storytime. This is Ron, and I have, am, have been reading from the 48 Laws of Power by, I believe it's Robert Greene. Yes, Robert Greene and Juiced Elfers. And today is Law 46. Right? Yes, Law 46. Never appear too perfect. The human animal has a hard time dealing with feelings of inferiority. In the face of superior skill, talent, or power, we are often disturbed and ill at ease. This is because most of us have an inflated sense of ourselves, and when we meet people who surpass us, they make it clear to us that we are in fact mediocre, or at least not as brilliant as we had thought. This disturbance in our image cannot last long without stirring up ugly emotions. At first, we feel envy. If only we had the quality or skill of the superior person, we would be happy. But envy brings us neither comfort nor any closer to equality, nor can we admit to feeling it, for it is frowned upon socially. To show envy is to admit to feeling inferior. To close friends, we may confess our secret unrealized desires, but we will never confess to feeling envy. So it goes underground. We disguise it in many ways, like finding grounds to criticize the person who makes us feel it. He may be smarter than I am, we say, but he has no morals or conscience. Or he may have more power, but that's because he cheats. If we do not slander him, perhaps we praise him excessively, another of envy's disguises. There are several strategies for dealing with the insidious, destructive uh, emotion of envy. First, accept the fact that there will be people who will surpass you in some way, and also the fact that you may envy them. But make that feeling a way of pushing yourself to equal or surpass them someday. Let envy turn inward and it poisons the soul. Expel it outward and it can move you to greater heights. Second, understand that as you gain power, those below you will feel envious of you. They may not show it, but it is inevitable. Do not need naively accept the facade they show you. Read between the lines of their criticisms, their little sarcastic remarks, the signs of backstabbing, the excessive praise that is preparing you for a fall, the resentment, resentful look in the eye. Half the problem with envy comes when we do not recognize it until it is too late. Finally, expect that when people envy you, they will work against you insidiously. They will put obstacles in your path that you will not foresee or that you cannot trace to their source. It is hard to defend yourself against this kind of attack, and by the time you realize that envy is at the root of a person's feelings about you, it is often too late. Your excuses, your false humility, your defensive actions only exacerbate the problem, since it is far easier to avoid creating envy in the first place than to get rid of it once it is there you should strategize to forestall it before it grows. It is often your own actions that stir up envy, your own unawareness. By becoming conscious of those actions and qualities that create envy, you can take the teeth out of it before it nibbles you to death. Kierkegaard believed that there are types of people who create envy and are as guilty when it arises as those who feel it. The most obvious type we all know, the moment something good happens to them, whether by luck or design, they crow about it. In fact, they get pleasure out of making people feel inferior. This type is obvious and beyond hope. There are others, however, who stir up the envy in more subtle and unconscious ways and are partly to blame for their troubles. Envy is often a problem, for example, for people with great natural talent. Sir Walter Raleigh was one of the most brilliant men at the court of Queen Elizabeth of England. He had skills as a scientist, wrote poetry still recognized as among the most beautiful writing of the time, was a proven leader of men, an enterprising entrepreneur, a great sea captain, and on top of all this was a handsome, dashing courtier who charmed his way into becoming one of the queen's favorites. Wherever he went, however, people blocked his path. Eventually, he suffered a terrific fall from grace, leading even to prison, and finally, the executioner's axe. 
Raleigh could not understand the stubborn opposition he faced from the other courtiers. He could not see that he had uh, not only made no attempt to disguise the degree of his skills and qualities, he had imposed them on one and all, making a show of his versatility, thinking it impressed people and won him friends. In fact, it made him silent en enemies, people who felt inferior to him and did all they could to ruin him the moment he tripped up or made the slightest mistake. In the end, the reason he was executed was treason, but envy will use any cover it finds to mask its destructiveness. The envy enlisted by Sir Walter Raleigh is the worst kind. It was inspired by his natural talent and grace, which he felt was best displayed in its full flower. Money others can attain, power as well, but superior intelligence, good looks, charm, these are qualities no one can acquire. The naturally perfect have to work the most to disguise their brilliance displaying a defect or two to deflect envy before it takes root. It is a common and naive mistake to think you are charming people with your natural talents when in fact they are coming to hate you. A great danger in the realm of power is the sudden improvement in fortune, an unexpected promotion, a victory or success that seems to come out of nowhere. And this is sure to stir up envy among your former peers. When Archbishop de Retz was promoted to the rank of cardinal in 1651, he knew full well that many of his former colleagues envied him. Understanding the foolishness of alienating those below him, de Retz did everything he could to downplay his merit and emphasize the role of luck in his success. To put people at ease, he acted humbly and deferentially as if nothing had changed. In reality, of course, he now had much more power than before. He wrote that these wise policies produced a good effect by lessening the envy which was conceived against me, which is the greatest of all secrets. Follow de Retz's example. Subtly emphasize how lucky you have been to make your happiness seem more attainable to other people and the need for envy less acute. But be careful not to affect a false modesty that people can easily see through. This will only make them more envious. The act has to be good. Your humility and your openness to those uh, you have left behind have to seem genuine. Any hint of insincerity will only make your new status more oppressive. Remember, despite your elevated position, it will do you no good to alienate your former peers. Power requires a wide and solid support base, which envy can silently destroy. Political power of any kind creates envy, and one of the best ways to deflect it before it takes root is to seem unambitious. When Ivan the Terrible died, Boris Godunov knew that he was the only one on the scene who could lead Russia. But if he sought the position eagerly, he would stir up envy and suspicion among the boyars. So he refused the crown, not once, but several times. He made people insist that he take the throne. George Washington used the same strategy to great effect, first in refusing to keep the position of commander-in-chief of the American army, second in resisting the presidency. In both cases, he made himself more popular than ever. People cannot envy the power that they themselves have given a person who does not seem to desire it. According to the Elizabethan statesman and writer Sir Francis Bacon, the wisest policy of the powerful is to create a kind of pity for themselves, as if their responsibilities were a burden and a sacrifice. How can one envy a man who has taken on a heavy load for the public interest? Disguise your power as a kind of self-sacrifice rather than as a source of happiness and you make it seem less enviable. Emphasize your troubles, and you turn a potential danger, envy, into a source of moral support, pity. A similar ploy is to hint that your good fortune will benefit those around you. To do this, you may need to open your purse strings. Like Simon, a wealthy general in ancient Athens who gave lavishly in all kinds of ways to prevent people from resenting the influence he had bought in Athenian politics. He paid a high price to deflect their envy, but in the end, it saved him from ostracism and banishment from the city. The painter J.M.W. Turner devised another way of giving to deflect the envy of his fellow artists, which he recognized as his greatest obstacle to his success. Noticing that his incom incomparable color skills made them afraid to hang their paintings next to his in exhibitions, he realized that their fair fear would turn to envy and would eventually make it harder for him to find galleries to show in. On occasion, then, Turner is known to have temporarily dampened the colors in his paintings with soot to earn him the goodwill of his colleagues. To deflect envy, Gracian recommends that the powerful display a weakness, a minor social indiscretion, a harmless vice. Give those who envy you something to feed on, distracting them from your more important sins.
Remember, it is the reality that matters. You may have to play games with appearances, but in the end, you will have what counts, true power. In some Arab countries, a man will avoid arousing envy by doing as Cosimo de Medici did, by showing his wealth only on the inside of his house. Apply this wisdom to your own character. Beware of somebody of envy's disguises. Excessive praise is almost sure sign that a person praising you envies you. They are either setting you up for a fall, it will be impossible for you to live up to their praise, or they are sharpening their blades behind your back. At the same time, those who are hypercritical of you or who slander you publicly probably envy you as well. Recognize their behavior as disguised envy, and you keep out of the trap of mutual mudslinging or of taking their criticisms to heart. Win your revenge by ignoring their measly presence. Do not try to help or do favors for those who envy you. They will think you are condescending to them. Joe Orton's attempt to help Hollywell find a gallery for his work only intensified his lover's feelings of inferiority and envy. Once envy reveals itself for what it is, the only solution is often to flee the presence of the enviers, leaving them to stew in a hell of their own creation. Finally, be aware that some environments are more conducive to envy than others. The effects of envy are more serious among colleagues and peers where there is a veneer of equality. Envy is also destructive in democratic environments where overt displays of power are looked down upon. Be extra sensitive in such environments. The filmmaker Ingmar Bergman was hounded by Swedish tax authorities because he stood out in a country where standing out from the crowd is frowned on. It is almost impossible to avoid envy in such cases, and there's little you can do but accept it graciously and take none of it personally. As Thoreau once said, envy is the tax which all distinction must pay. Reversal. The reason for being careful with the envious is that they are so indirect and will find innumerable ways to undermine you, but treading carefully around them will often only make their envy worse. They sense that you are being cautious and it registers as yet another sign of your superiority. That is why you must act before envy takes root. Once envy is there, however, whether through your fault or not, it is sometimes best to effect the opposite approach. Display the utmost disdain for those who envy you. Instead of hiding your perfection, make it obvious. Make every new triumph an opportunity to make the envious squirm. Your good fortune and power become their living hell. If you attain a position of unimpeachable power, their envy will have no effect on you, and you will have the best revenge of all. They are trapped in envy while you are free in your power. This is how Michelangelo triumphed over the venomous architect Bramante, who turned Pope Julius against Michelangelo's design for his tomb. Bramante envied Michelangelo's godlike skills, and to this one triumph, the aborted tomb project, he thought to add another, by pushing the Pope to commission Michelangelo to paint the murals in the Sistine Chapel. The project would take years, during which Michelangelo would accomplish no more of his brilliant sculptures. Furthermore, Bramante considered Michelangelo not nearly as skilled in painting as in sculpture. The chapel would spoil his image as the perfect artist. Michelangelo saw the trap and wanted to turn down the commission, but he could not refuse the Pope, so he accepted it without complaint. Then, however, he used Bramante's envy to spur him to greater heights, making the Sistine Chapel his most perfect work of all. Every time Bramante heard of it or saw it, he felt more oppressed in his own envy the sweetest and most lasting revenge you can exact on the envious. And that was Law 46 of the 48 Laws of Power. And on uh, Saturday the 9th, um, I'll be reading Law 47. Do not go past the mark you aimed for. In victory, learn when to stop. The moment of victory is often the moment of greatest peril. In the heat of victory, arrogance and overconfidence can push you past the goal you had aimed for, and by going too far, you make more enemies than you defeat. Do not allow success to go to your head. There's no substitute for strategy and careful planning. Set a goal, and when you reach it, stop. And that will be on Saturday the 9th. Until then, thank you for joining me, and have a great day.